Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough, coming to you from Crew West Studio in Los Angeles. Man, do we have a cool program for you all today. I have no doubt you will learn, grow, and be inspired by today's show. Before we get into our main event, I want to thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode and subscribe. Your likes and follows help ensure you won't miss any of our new shows, and it makes the algorithm gods happy, which helps us, so thanks for that. Also, be sure to visit our website, notrealart.com, sign up for our newsletter to keep your finger on the pulse of everything we're doing here at Not Real Art for artists and art lovers. A lot of great stuff there. On the website, you'll get free educational videos. You can sign up for our artist grant for the chance to receive $2,000. You can buy affordable original contemporary art through our partnership with Sugar Press, And you can become a supporter through Patreon if you want. So be sure to check out our website today for all the good, healthy stuff we got for you. Today's show is super great. I'm really stoked about it. I got my good friend, Shows Art here, a.k.a. The Art Jedi. And I've known Shows now for a few years. Met him through our boy, Man One. He was showing at the Art at the Rendon, for those of you in L.A. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But Shows is a special dude, and I just love talking to him. He's so smart, and his view on the world is unique and powerful. And I'm actually a collector of his work as well. I love his work. Shows has been involved with uh, things that we've been doing. He painted live at some of our events. He has attended our conference. He's applied, I think, this year even for our grant, which is awesome. Shows is born and raised L.A., man. I mean, he uh, has been in love with art since he was a kid. He did his first mural in South Central L.A. at 13. Basically, he hasn't looked back since then. I mean, he definitely is a known entity here in the L.A. community. A lot of love, a lot of power, a lot of intelligence. Shows art chooses to be anonymous. He lives in Skid Row, and he works tirelessly to elevate the Skid Row community, which is so important and so needed because these are the folks that are so easily forgotten and overlooked by their fellow citizens. Through his work, he chooses to represent those on Skid Row and others among us who are underrepresented, certainly in the arts and media, and helping to give a voice and a face to those who may not have the means to speak for themselves. Shows is a real deal. He's a dear friend. I'm honored to have him on. It's a privilege. And without further ado, let's get into this and hear from Shows Art, a.k.a. The Art Jedi. Shows Art, welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. Man, highly appreciate being here, man. Highly appreciate being here. Dude, I appreciate you being here, man. This is long overdue. Oh, man. You know, for a while, I was sitting there saying, I need to get my stats up so I can start being interviewed with not real art. I mean, one thing I can say, you don't play favors. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm one of you guys' favorite artists, you know what I mean? But the work still has to be done, you know? Well, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, yes, but at the end of the day, like it is that it is that special combination of like being a fantastic human being, which you are, but then also being that fantastic artist. I mean, we would love you anyway, but you're like a triple threat because you got all the goods. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. You know, and the thing when I first met you, I didn't have art studio. Now I have my own art studio. So it's, talk it's to growing. me, man. Yeah, I know. But, I know. Uh, so that's big news. So part of why we want to do this, right, is we want to break news. We want to catch up, find out what's new, what's exciting. And in fact, you got a studio. That's new and exciting. Talk to me. Tell me about it. Well, you know, our first initial meet, man, one gave me the opportunity to do Art at the Rendon. Yep. And when he gave me the opportunity at Art at the Rendon, he switched over and allowed me to be the head artist. And he said he was my assistant. And that was his art project. And in that project, we converted that room to look like where I was at 
to where I was going. And that was two and a half years ago. And in that room, we projected me being in Skid Row painting on the corner. And when you looked on the other side of the room, it was what I, what we wanted to happen, which was me being in galleries and having my own art studio and a place to display my work. Worked hard at it and we're here now. So um, it just shows to stay consistent how it works. That's it, man. You got to be faithful, right? It's like this bullshit about overnight success or whatever. It's just that it's bullshit. You got to just stay faithful. You got to keep at it again and again and again. And next thing you know, you're an overnight success 10 years later, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shit, it, it, it's know? an overnight thing, but you don't know what night it's going to be. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. But I tell you what, I love what I'm seeing because it looks like you got a big space. I see your work up on the wall, so many, lots of pieces. So where exactly is your studio? Tell me about it. How big is it? Where you at? Talk to me. Well, it's good, man. About 1,300 square feet. Nice. In the art district, right over the 4th Street Bridge. Nice. Not far from my Skid Row community. Access for the Skid Row community to come in and get some time in to uh, have room for them to do their art. Yep. We just built the recording studio. That's what you see in the background with all that stuff right there. That's the insulation and all that stuff because we built the recording studio right here where we're at. Here's the steps to go up the recording studio. Nice. Right. So we have the recording studio here so we can also do music, audio. Yeah. And a podcast. Yep. It just worked out perfect, man. I'm right over in the art district, right? Boyle Heights and art district. Right, right, right. Well, man, I mean, I love what I'm hearing because, I mean, basically it sounds like what you're creating there is a multi-use kind of multidisciplinary space for all kinds of artists, creatives, creators to come in and create with you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how it got created for me. I wanted to do what Man One did for me, allow a space for other artists that don't have the space to be seen. That's how I got my chance with Man One. That's actually how I got a chance in this studio period. Uh, someone else gave me a shot to paint live during their session. and. I just feel that that's how it was created for me. I think I should be a person to just keep that going on. Yeah, man, that's beautiful, right? I mean, that sense of responsibility to pay it forward, pay it back, that spirit of gratitude. It's always been prevalent in you. And so I'm not surprised at all to hear this. Although I wonder if man one knows, I look forward to him finding that out because that's a beautiful full circle kind of story there. I think he knows. When I first, my first week here, we had an interview to do for, uh, is it called The Boyle? Okay. Yeah, I'm a not magazine sure. magazine or a newspaper in Boyle Heights. Okay. I know it's a paper about authentic culture and art in Boyle Heights, and I can't remember the actual newspaper, but I did my first interview here with Man One. Nice. He's actually, my first newspaper article and interview and all that was done here with Man One, and so he knows about it. Great. Okay, cool, cool. So you've been in there a minute. Like, when did you move in? When did you find the space? going on two years it was the 19th of july 2019 july. okay yeah because i think the last time i saw you i was trying to think about that i know i saw you at the brewery right when i picked yeah. up my piece when i got because i'm a shows art collector myself yeah yeah and so that's where you were working out of the brewery at that time so you must have gotten that space you know not too long after that yeah you know what that's the thing the lady that I work out of her studio, uh, Cinda Valle, she's my oil paint instructor and mentor with oil painting. She invited me to this space to do a live painting. Right. So I got in this space from her. So I, at times, depending on what I'm doing or what kind of work I'm working on, I go to her space at the brewery to work because it's challenging. She has 40 plus years in oil painting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's like getting next to a, a guru. And just learning as much as you can, because you can't be there and learn all that technique and all that in hours. You know? Oh, my God. No, no, no. 40 years beats 10,000 hours. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, uh, by a long okay. shot, by a long shot. Well, you know, it's just dawning on me. I mean, this year has been so fucked up on so many levels. But the fact that actually, I think the last time I saw you was our Christmas party. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, we had the holiday party, which was a great, great night. And fun was had by all. Holiday cheer was had. And then a couple months later, all hell breaks loose. I haven't seen you since the holiday party, but man, it is so great to see you now. So for the listeners who actually don't know your story, break it down for us a little bit. I mean, because obviously being in a studio for any artist is special, but for you in particular, it's extra special. So share your story with our listeners. All right. Well, I come from Skid Row. I'm an artist out of South Central LA at Skid Row. I became an artist in Skid Row and it was by fluke, I think. Constantly want to know how to make a mark in Los Angeles with art. Skid Row was the area 
that really needed beautification. I found that they allowed graffiti art to stand, and it took a while for them to come cover it. I had to figure out a way, how could I connect with those in the community without the police thinking that I was also a dealer myself. So the thing to do was to, it was like being in school, first thing I would do would be drawing or something that fast, and then whoever's interested in what I was doing would come and ask the questions. What am I doing? How could I get involved? So it became an icebreaker in Skid Row, and I started to see that we had a lot of artists in Skid Row alone. And it's an area, it's like Skid Row right now is homesteading. It's a ground that really hasn't been, in certain areas, hasn't been founded. It's known for mental health, it's known for drugs, it's known for hookers, it's not known for art. So it left a real big opportunity for me to be known as an artist because art isn't seen in that area. So it was a lot of blank walls, but it has a lot of graffiti. So my thing was, okay, I can cover these walls with some kind of art. But my thing is, at the time, I really didn't have utensils to do murals. So I had to find what was around in the community to start painting with. And people in the community knew I did art. So when they would be out recycling, their whole thing was to find supplies for me. They knew they could get money out of me if they brought me supplies because I'd buy the art supplies. Yeah. I started to be known as the artist in Skid Row because people were like, hey, you know, the artist, he'll buy those cans. People started to know me as the artist in Skid Row to where now it gave me utensils. It probably wasn't the utensils I needed to paint on the walls, but at least it was utensils for me to be able to paint, period, to make product. Right. And like those pallets in the back, yeah, they come from people recycling. And then I'll pay three bucks to five dollars for the pallet, depending on how the size uh, a lot of times I would give six bucks for the pallet. They're only giving $2 or maybe $3. So a person's making double up for me. So it's actually employing someone in Skid Row to go out and hustle to make some money. And now I can make money. So I saw it as a double whammy because now I'm employing someone. Someone's hustle has now been employed and it's giving me something to where I can make some money. And then when I make money, it allows me to be able to pay more for my product and buy more from who's actually going out to hustle to get the pallets or um, the hustle to bring me old canvases. A lot of times they bring on new canvases, canvases that are just thrown out because they've gotten damaged as far as dirty, or they do so much hustling, they get gifts from some of the neighbors around because you don't believe how many people really make a relationship with someone if you just speak with them. So a lot of our neighbors are really great friends with some of the people that stay in lofts and own businesses to where they get gifts at times. And I'm one of the first people whenever art comes up to where they're bringing me their art supplies. So that's kind of how it happened for me in Skid Row as being the artist in Skid Row, of being known for the artist in Skid Row, and then organizing, just working with certain people in the community as far as General Jeff and, and uh, Manuel Benito Compito. They want to help the artists in Skid Row have a name and a place to display their art. So they're really big on pushing the artists in the area. And whenever anyone from someone else comes into the area to do art, they're really big on pushing them to collaborate with the artists that are already in Skid Row. What years are we talking about? If you take us back, what year is this that you're well, talking about? What years? I came into Skid Row and started doing my artwork in 2000. No, I think my first mural in Skid Row was 2005. Okay. 2004 was probably my first mural in Skid Row. And it was working with Skid Row Housing Trust. I got a, my first job doing spoken word three days a week and art classes on Friday. And it was just a space so people could come in and just express themselves. You could get on the microphone and cuss someone out. You do whatever you wanted to. The whole thing was just giving a space for the community to come in, have an open microphone to give their talent, if they had a talent, or just to be heard. Because sometimes people just wish to be heard. Yes. And at the same time, we had art supplies there throughout the week so people could just participate in doing art. And they allowed me to paint a mural at their facility. And that was like 2004 when I first did my mural there, but I came to Skid Row in 99. Yeah, yeah. I came to Skid Row in 99 as a drug dealer trying to figure out how to make money with art. And I figured that I would sell drugs, make enough money selling drugs that I could uh, buy my supplies. Right, right, right. I had a kid and that changed everything. Yeah, but I mean, if I recall, you and I were talking one night and you were telling me that you had a mind for math. Yeah, my plan when I went to college was to be a art major and a math minor. Mm -hmm. And then my dream was to go to China, play for the Beijing Ducks, and be a math teacher in China. 
but uh, I couldn't learn the language, and I didn't really like the food that much. Well, but right. So, <laughs> yeah, fuck the language. If you don't like the food, don't go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I couldn't the... understand the language at all, and food just didn't work for me. I'm, yeah. I'm you know, too Americanized. You know what I mean? You go there, yeah, ask yeah. For orange chicken, they look at you like, what the hell is orange chicken? <laughs> well, so your story is just so inspiring, bro, and everything you're doing to this well, day. I do want to be honest, too, Scott. Art really wasn't the choice when I first got. I came to Skid Row as a drug dealer. Art became a promise. My fiance, beautiful lady, she was telling me to do art, and I was telling her that art really didn't pay. I don't really see my artwork or the type of art I do in museums and galleries. And I knew no one of my culture making money in art. And I mean, from graffiti to right. melanated, it didn't matter. I just knew no one. Knew. The phrase starving artist is a phrase for a very real reason. Exactly. But uh, I told her if she had a kid for me, things would change. So when my son was born in 2006, I went for the gusto. And going for that worked out pretty well. But um, I had a situation with my landlord because at the time I was still selling drugs. And I needed to finish up what I had. And then my whole thing was to open up a boutique and having custom shoes, artwork, designs on clothes and shit. And I could get the things sold. And my landlord robbed me. She broke in my house. Well, she didn't break in. She's a landlord. But I consider it breaking in. Yeah. She was a sheriff. She illegally evicted me. And I had nothing there. But when I got to my house, there's nothing in the house at all, Scott. The only thing that's in my house, because she's taking everything, couches, everything. The only thing that's in my house is paint supplies. I had brushes and I had paint. I didn't have a safe. My safe with my money was gone. My guns are gone. I mean, everything, my... Breast pumps, because my, my lady just had the baby. So the baby's like three months old or two months old, somewhere around there. So the mm. breast pump is gone to pump the milk. I mean, diapers are gone. There's nothing in the house, period. Wow. But there's one trash bag in the middle of the floor, and it has paints and brushes in it. I had told myself, I had asked God, I said, you know, if, if I have a kid, just let me make it out the game, and I promise I'll leave everything alone, and I'll just do my art. So he's a couple months old, and I'm still trying to finish up all this dope I have so I can leave it alone and do something different. So the yeah. first day I got finished, totally done, thought I made the money that I need to make, put it in safe. I go work out. I come back home. Nothing's in the house but these paintbrushes. And I saw it as a sign of God or the energy, however anyone wants to see yeah. it. Yeah. Saying, are you going to universe was telling you yeah. something. Are you yeah. going to stick with what you said you're going to do? Woo. That's how it got started. It was like, I said what I was going to do. And if I had the kid, the kid was healthy and the lady stayed with me, then I'd attack this art. So that's how we got into this whole art. The universe is holding you accountable. Holding me accountable, brother. So I've been sticking with it since. And my son's 15 now. Well, I was going to say, I was going to ask, I was a shout out to your son. How old is he? And what's his name? His name is Artis. Artis. Shout out Artis. Yeah. Yeah. And he's 15 Artiste, now? Is he, he's, uh, is he tall like you? He's taller than me now. He's about to be 6'3". <laughs> yeah, at 15, man. It's amazing, man. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And the thing is crazy. I got a call today from him. He wants to sign up to play basketball. That shocked me. And then he's been talking about doing some artwork. So it's two things that I've been really wanting him to do that he's been talking <laughs> to me about lately. So it's like, okay, I mean, I guess something's finally setting in. Yeah, you know, chip, block, all that stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, if I say I don't want him to do it, then he'd probably love it. <laughs> exactly. You know how that works. I got to listen and learn because my boy's just four. I got a ways to go. Yeah, hey, the last picture I saw you and him, man, looked real good, man. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, he's he's he looks awesome. like you're doing a great job. He looks happy. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, you're just trying to keep him healthy and keep him sane, right? I mean, that's it. You know, the crazy part about it, Scott, like that picture that's in the background of me right now with the guy tying the shoes of his son. I've been telling my son for so long when he grows up that once he gets a certain age, he's just a little melanated kid. Excuse my language. He's just a little nigga walking around. He's just a little black kid. And no one's going to know his age because he's so tall. But when I was saying this, I didn't know that we would have this pandemic and we'd be wearing masks so you really can't see his face. And now I'm more nervous than ever because you really can't see his face now. He stands just as tall as me. And before, at least you could see his face. Now you can't. So with this George Floyd thing going on, and I mean, it's never stopped. It's crazy. It's been 30 years since the Rodney King riot. February 25th. I made 30 years. And we're still talking about this shit. And cops are still getting off to this day. 
You know, when people look at my artwork, a lot of people say, oh, you're a black artist and you're a revolutionary artist. And, all that. and that's not what I am. I'm an artist. And for some reason, the times haven't changed to where melanated people are suppressed. So my artwork is expressing the times. This is a time that never has stopped. So, I mean, I would love to paint roses and I would love to paint flowers. And, you know, I'm paid to do that when I'm doing murals and stuff like that. But when it comes to just my artwork that I'm putting out, there's a fire that needs to be put out. And if I don't project it in my artwork, then people don't know it exists. So I've been doing this pandemic artwork. I've been doing this, what they want to call it, this Black Lives Matter, this We Are The People. Because I'm not really on the Black Lives Matter. I think all lives matter. I understand there's a certain culture that's been suppressed right now. But I think if we quit separating everything and make it just one, then some things will stop. My projection to my kids is always letting them know that they're more than being black, not allowing themselves to box themselves so they can hopefully see more and see what more that's offered than just what's in the neighborhoods and just what's in a script with being black. And then at the same time, letting them not hold on to the past because the past doesn't make them who they are. I'm not saying I'm not teaching them what's going on and where we come from and what's being done and what's been said. But my main thing is letting them know that it's about their history. What do they want to write and what do they want to be written? Because they ask me like, Dad, why do you paint what you paint? Or why do you draw what you draw? And my whole thing is that's what an artist is supposed to do. An artist is supposed to express the times that are going on or the need for something to change. So um, I guess that's pretty much what I'm trying to say with my artwork. It's not that it's artwork that's black art or it's revolutionary art. It's just art that something needs to change and there's a problem within the system. One of the things I love about your work is that you're speaking truth to power. And you're not even to power. You're just speaking truth. And for people whose hearts are open, eyes are open, minds are open, they can see that. Yeah. Well, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, and it's interesting too. I love what you're saying because these issues in who am I to comment on any of this, but like these are complicated issues in the black community, the Hispanic community, you know, all these different communities, they're not monolithic and everybody's experience is different. And it's interesting to hear you talk about that, about not looking back, but looking forward, because of course there is a lot of anger and deep yeah. scars for good That's reason, obviously. Does. Right. That's so, so. Does. That's what it does. I don't think really a lot of people realize it's a post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? To grow up in the neighborhood alone is stressful. And then to put all these other conditions on of how someone was treated, what rights you should have. And to put all these things in front of a person that's just trying to succeed is a hardship. I feel some things are hurdles. Hurdles, Sometimes yeah. you don't need things in front of us that are making situations harder. For me personally, the reason why I say it is to make a person feel like they have to hold on to something that really can scar them or hinder them from success, to me, is not fair. I don't think that's fair. I think that's unfair. And the reason why I say that, when I think about growing up, I play real cool with everyone. But I think you start to get different treatment once they start to show the uh, Black History Month. Because if they never show that, no one, I don't think, will start to mistreat others. Okay, they don't show the Holocaust every year. I don't even remember seeing the Holocaust in school. I remember them talking about it, but I really don't remember them seeing videos about it. They might show some pictures, but they don't show video of the Holocaust. But when it comes to Black History Month, you get videos, you get pictures, you get all kind of stuff, and you get it for 13 years for a whole month. They just indebt this in you for like 13 years for a whole month. And then when you leave school and you're at home, you know, your parents, black and proud, this and that, this and this date within your race, stay strong, you know, so you get all this put on you and you get all this fuel. And if no one teaches you how to utilize that fuel, you can gas yourself the wrong way. And for me, I didn't gas myself. It wasn't the wrong way, but it wasn't proper. It hindered me from growth that I could have had when I was put in situations where I wanted better. And what I mean by that is you take me out of the neighborhood and you put me in a suburban area to where I now can be successful prep school, things this fashion. But I want to show you that I didn't grow up in a preppy area because I don't want to be the talking white or acting like I'm not from the neighborhood when actually it's no different. I mean, to drop a script and pick up another shouldn't have been a problem. But for me, it, it felt like I was trying to be something I wasn't and wasn't holding on to the neighborhood I came from. And all that did was hinder me. All it did was stop my growth. And it didn't allow me to see how I could grow further because I wanted to not do things 
that I didn't see my friends doing. I didn't want to go to the galleries. None of my friends were going to the galleries. I didn't want to draw. None of my friends were drawing. So it had me holding on to being black and holding on to being a statistic when I could have broke barriers in so many different ways. Where did you grow up, Shows? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, but I was raised in South Central L.A. Elementary school, high school. I actually graduated in Missouri. I went back home my senior year in Missouri, but uh, I'm an L.A. cat. South Central L.A., college, California, until I went to FAMU in Florida for not long at all, and then went into school in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't graduate, actually. Dropped out of school with like 15 units, shy of a B.A. Why did you drop out? No more basketball. <laughs> I didn't see any reason to play anymore. I was hurt. Couldn't get back to get a scholarship anywhere, so went on to try to play pro. Shit, man. I mean, it's what, again, just so much respect and love for your brother because, I mean, you've got so much talent. And when I think about your intellect, not just for the art, but for math and science and just general academics, and then you've got the athletic thing. <laughs> it's like you're a triple threat, brother. Man, I wish everybody else thought that. <laughs> We're probably making some things happen right about now, you know? And I'm not even going to get into the good looks, the handsome uh, debonair. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love the look tonight, yeah. by the way. Love it. Well, look, man, I did the only interview ever without my mask for you guys. Man One gave me my opportunity. He gave me my shot. And for that, all at the written show, that's the only thing you can actually find where you can see who I am. Yeah. Because Man One told me, he said, with us being where we come from, I would really appreciate if you just did this interview and did this show without covering up. And it was a, uh, the opportunity that he gave me. So my whole thing was to honor that and to go with it. But I mean, this is the image. Yeah. How did you and man meet? I mean, I don't even know that I know that story exactly. So how did you and man one hook up? Well, you know, I've been trying to meet man one for years. When you guys had crew West on Winston. Yep. I used to always go by and check out the space. There's always, you know, Indian Alley with all the artists bandit and other artists that were over there. I just never could meet him. For some reason, even when I came through shows, where I would come to the art shows and stuff like that, I never could get a chance to meet him. So I never got a chance to meet him. And then two years ago, General Jeff gave me a call because man one, I got the call for the Art of the Rhythm show. And he called General Jeff and he told General Jeff, he says, hey, I need a homeless artist. And at that time I was homeless. Still somewhat that way. You know, this is a live workspace. I still don't have my place to live. But the great thing is making money to be able to help. And I work here 24-7. So if I happen to fall asleep here, they can't tell me, they can't say they want to kick me out because at least I'm working, you know? It's just a workspace. But at the time I was homeless, didn't have a place for my art or anything. So man, one got a General Jeff because he said he couldn't see how how to house his artwork for seven days when there's artists on the street that are homeless. So that was our initial meeting. General Jeff gave me a call. My lady had just got off the street with the kids and she had got an apartment and I was at her apartment and I got the call from General Jeff. He said, hey, man, are you available to come meet with Man One? And I was like, the Man One? Like, Man One, the graffiti artist, Man One? He's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. When? He was like, can you be here in like an hour? So I Ubered. I Ubered there to make it there in less than 45 minutes. And that's how we met. We met at Catch 21. And the crazy part about it, five months before I met Man One, you know, he did that book, the children's book. Children's book, yeah. DJ. So he's going around to all these conferences, and he's in Texas at a conference. And it's a lady that's a principal for this school, junior high school. And she's sitting at the table with Man One. And he says he's a graffiti artist in Los Angeles. And she asked him, does he know me? She's like, hey, do you know this artist? You know, he's like, no, I don't know. I've never met him before. And she's like, well, he works in Skid Row and all this. And when I meet him that day, I brought it up. I was like, hey, you know, it's this principal that she said she met you. Her name is Donna. And he remembered that. And that was just funny on how... It was in the past. She brought me up to him five months prior to him actually. Again, the universe working, you know? It's crazy. And like when I tell her this now, she cries. Yeah. She cries because she remembers me saying I want to do some of my art. She remembers me wanting to do great things. She's watched me grow. And she brings 50 to 70 kids every summer for me to take on a tour through L.A. And it's a missionary group that they bring from Texas. So she's seen my growth. She's been coming. Well, the advent came the last summer because of COVID. But nine years before last summer, nine years straight, two years ago when she came, the first year we did the Rendon show and all that, when she came that summer, 
I told her the story, and she just cried. And she's one of the hardest women ever. I've never seen her cry, ever. She's one of the toughest women I've ever seen in my life. And then I brought that story. I've never seen her cry in nine years. Like, I promise you, when I give my story, I get five to ten kids and adults every session that cries. She's been coming nine years and have heard my story and has never shed a tear. She just always says, you're going to make it out. God has you. You're going to make it out. So I must have told her I met Man One and he did the art show and she just bawled. She just bawled in tears, man. I was so amazed. And everyone turned and looked at me and they said, Shows, you got Donna to cry. <laughs> I said, man, I guess I did. Yeah. I guess, I guess it, it took me to bring up Man One for it to happen. Well, but, yeah, but it's yeah. a humbling thing, right? When you realize that the universe has used you in some way, right? So like the universe used her in a special way and she saw that, felt that, and that's a humbling thing. Yes, yeah, sir. It worked out perfect, man. Like you said, man, it's just something how it all comes together. Yeah, man. What's the song? We are beings living in a spiritual world. Yeah, that's why I don't like my face being shown. It's not me doing the artwork. It's just, I did it. I actually produced it. Someone else probably was thinking it. It's just in the universe. Well, you're a conduit, right? You're a vessel. You're a channel. Yeah, exactly. Just a channel. That's it. I think if we all realize that we're just channels to this energy, we probably do better. We wouldn't try to own everything. I agree, man. I agree. Because, I mean, there's something about a certain number of people in this world or a certain kind of people in this world or whatever that have dominion or they want to manipulate or they want to control or they want to own or they want to just exploit or whatever. And it's like, man, no, man, we're here to serve. We're here just to live with gratitude and appreciation. I mean, I guess that's the yin yang of it all, you know? I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) you're right about that. That's just the yin yang of it all. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I don't, the light and the dark, the positive and the negative. I mean, maybe that's how it all balances out. Yeah. But I mean, for me, like, that's why for me, I've always just artists throughout my whole life and my roots are in music. So musicians first, but then eventually visual artists and even designers or just dancers. I mean, just whatever artists that you're talking about to me on a certain level, there's how shall we say like angels among us. Yeah. I mean, if they're tapped in, if they really want to be that channel. For those of us who lost our religion a long time ago, and to each their own, everybody's on their own spiritual journey. But for people like me who lost our religion a long time ago, it's like, well, where do I find God? Where do I get fed? And for me, it's pretty simple. It's being in nature, being outside, out of doors in nature feeds my soul, and artists feed my soul. It kind of just you know, is about that. I, it's funny you say that, Scott. I'm in a nonprofit with the Sidewalk Project. Some have, are totally, they're not against religion, but they've lost religion. And I understand that. I understand that because, you know, I've always found that hard for so long when the America was saying that the black man was to be enslaved, couldn't learn to read, couldn't get education. They spoke about Christianity and all that while they were castrating and holding the Bible and things this fashion. So I've always wanted to know And then it's amazing, like if I was to tell a lot of black or melanated people that Jesus Christ isn't white or some of that fashion, a lot of people stop going to church. They'd probably stop going to church if I was to say that. So it's amazing that you still, and a lot of other people I function with, find love through energy. And you don't need a God or someone's prophet for you to project the love that you wish to receive. I think that's also great because... It's not actually religion that's going to save you. (laughs) We have to save ourselves and we have to save each other. And we have to do it through love and forgiveness. Bingo. And that's it. And, you know, I lost my religion, but you know what? I mean, I very much dug what Jesus was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Just because we're saying we lost religion doesn't mean that we don't believe in stories and the word. That's right. We just don't gangbang. We wish to not be involved in gangs. Right. That's right. Group think. (laughs) <laughs> it's not my yeah. thing. You know? yeah, the group thing isn't my thing. There you it know. is. It's like, listen, I mean, not to get all into this, but I mean, for me, when everybody's on their own journey, but I just grew very uncomfortable with this attitude of certainty. It's like, oh, no, no, no. We got the answer for everybody. This yeah, is the answer got. right yeah, here. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? We got the answer for everybody. Everybody, yeah. Oh, you do. Wow, you're a really special person. You got the answer for all humanity. The answer. The only one. <laughs> the only one. Yes. This is the yes. only one. And you got it. <laughs> Ooh. Boy, let me give you some money. 
what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You got the answer for everybody. That, and you hit that one on the nose. So. <laughs> and that's true, man, because everybody's custom, man. Yes. Everybody's custom. You know, I just had to tell my son this the other day. Like, for me to constantly get into it with him, when he's an artist, he's free spirit. He's not built the way these schools are designed for him to be programmed. Right. That's not how he learns. And the school wants me to beat it in him. And I'm not going to do that. And then they want me to have an argument with him and punish him. And they're not telling me that, but they want me to discipline him for the grades that he's not bringing home that they think he should have. They want you to back them up. Basically. One thing I got to realize is shit. He's 15, man. He has four more years of this shit. So do I want to ruin my son's life? Not even that. Do I want to ruin my relationship with my son for four more years that really doesn't fucking matter for the rest of his life? Because, I mean, shit, my grandfather had a third grade education. I'm not dissing education, but what I am realizing is who my son is. And when I had my son, I was a dope dealer that was saying, fuck the world. So that energy and that soldier is what's produced. So I have to figure out how to program that energy. You know, that's like building up a fighter and then telling him he can't go fight. Like, right. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. not what I did. That's not what I had. And you know your son. I mean, you know who he is. You know his soul. And so you have to respect that. You have to honor that. You have to it, act man. accordingly. That's it. And then I also realized, too, Scott, that that's what I'm doing what I'm doing now because I'm not waiting for my son to graduate to let him off into the world to go on his own. I'm building the foundation I want him to follow into. And if he doesn't want to follow into, at least I can give him a lane through my art, throughout the nonprofits I work with, through the lanes I'm getting down. So I'm just not leaving him to bear to go off into the world for them to judge and give him a job. I'll have, I'll have it situated. Yeah. me being a new dad, you know I mean? I got two kids under eight. I've been thinking a lot about this stuff too. And what I want is, a, I hope I'm able to do this, but I want to raise my children to be mentally healthy people who think yeah. for themselves. And I like how you say that. Mentally healthy. And to be mentally healthy is understanding the grading categories need to be dropped. Yeah. That can build a mental block. Like me thinking I was black and proud and wanting to be black and proud, man. I don't know how many people I really looked racist in front of. And I'm not racist. You know? Right, I don't right. know how many people probably thought like they really wanted to help me, but then when they heard me speak, how ignorant I sounded, and made them really want to say, you know what? I'm going to let him figure this out on his own. And it hurts me now to know that, that I don't want to change anything in where I'm at in life. I don't want to change anything because I love my kids. I love my lady I'm with and all this. But, you know, there was a time when I was in a place in my life to where, yeah, you're not black. I'm not dating you because I felt I was feeling less of my culture because I've always heard light skin's prettier, mixed kids are better. And I held on to that so long and so hard that I realized I'm born in America. I'm mixed. You know, and I put that condition on me so hard. And I realized that I'm mixed. I mean, I could have went to school and paid half of my tuition just because I have more than 16% Indian in me. So, I mean, like, I'm holding on to things that just didn't need, I didn't need to hold on to. To this day, I just feel the growth I've had since I haven't. I'm proud to be a human and I'm not proud to be black. I'm just proud to be a human. A friend of mine told me something real heavy because I have to watch how I say it because a lot of people have died to honor being my coach. So I don't want a person to be like, oh, you're degrading it. Or you just paint all that shit because you're faking it. That's not what I'm saying. My thing is, a friend of mine told me, he says, I don't have a problem with a person in their color. I have a problem with a person that wears their color. Wow. And that right there struck me. It struck me heavy because it's like I didn't realize that being black or being white or being anything is just a script. It's just a script. That's why people will see Bill Clinton and like, oh, yeah, he's black. He's down. Because he has the script. Mm. Or I could see some kid that didn't grow up where I grew up at. He grew up in the suburbs. When I see him, I'm like, he's not black. He ain't no nigga. He didn't grow up where I grew up at. He don't speak the way I speak. He don't listen to music I listen to. That means he didn't have my script. So once I realized that it was just a script, I had to realize, like, damn, I'm just acting. Because I'm only being what someone told me to be. And I've always said I'm not black and I'm not this because I didn't agree to it. I just think that's another name for nigger, boy, color. So why am I being what I didn't create for myself? And I started having to realize, like, damn, am I the same like with religion? Am I just religion because my parents put me here? Am I acting black because someone told me I am? Like, who am I? And that's what I started having to realize who I am. And once you start hearing that conscious, if I read something 
but I don't say it. How do I hear myself say it when I didn't even break a sound barrier? And that's where I found out that's who I really am, that consciousness inside of me, that person that speaks, that breaks sound barriers without me hearing it. That's who I really am. And that person's not trying to impress anyone. That soul or that energy is just trying to be loved, project love, receive love. That's it. So when I can stick with that, that inner voice, I don't get personal and I don't get selfish. And it allows me to just be a human being. Everything you're saying just resonates with me because I've wondered so many times, at what point do we just realize we're all earthlings? Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like We're all on this fucking planet in the middle of the fucking universe. You know how precarious this shit is? (laughs) It's like when we get invaded by the aliens and suddenly we realize we're in this together, you know? We're in this together. Yeah. That's where we'll finally realize we're in it together. But my thing, Scott, is most people that say we're different, they have a college education. Oh, and I in know. California, to graduate with an AA or anything, you have to have biology with a lab. And in that biology with a lab, they say nothing about races. Nothing at all. You do biology. Yeah. You have to do a lab. I mean, if you take biology with a lab, I just know you have to have some kind of science with lab. You have to have science with lab. It doesn't have to be a biology, but you have to have a science class with a lab to graduate college in California. Mm -hmm. I don't know about everywhere else, but I know here in Cali alone, that is a requirement to get a BA or an AA. And it's mind boggling to see how many people still wish to categorize themselves with false information of them being black, them being white. I understand the culture if you come from an island. I'm Belizean, I'm Caribbean, I'm from Mexico. I'm gonna get that, I'll take that all day. I'm Brazilian, I'm Irish, I'll take that all day. But when it comes to a person because of their shade, trying to hold on to a race, I don't get that with them being college graduates. Yeah, man. It is not said. Mm -hmm. Nothing in biology has ever said anything about white, black, or any of that. It's just chromosomes, cells. We all bleed red. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. You know, we all bleed red. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, again, I tread carefully when I try to open my mouth around these things because I got nothing but... I try to have nothing but respect and empathy, and I try to understand. I do. And one of the things I've wondered about, I'm not saying this is it, I'm just wondered about it, because I don't care how much melatonin you have in your skin, at least in this country, socioeconomics is like the issue. Yeah. Socioeconomics is the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And when people are educated, it makes a difference. It makes a big difference, man. Huge difference. When you got a little money in the bank and you can afford health care, it makes a difference. It does. It does. I mean, I can't see these things affecting LeBron James because one thing, one reason why I say that is he just didn't grow himself. He made sure he groomed everyone around him also to be a stud and to take care of their own narrative, to be their own narrative of their story. And that right there, it makes it kind of hard to penetrate him in the fashions that most people can penetrate people and knock them down. Like everyone around him, he's grown up with. And he's helped them the way they've helped him become who he is. So I think it's more so like what you and Man One have done, what I'm doing with myself. When you build a great community around yourself and a great family, great community, it's hard to fall. I can't see myself going back to a tent with the support that I have now. And it's not even that I have to be more accountable for my actions and all that because more people are looking at me. It's not even that. I'm the same person. I'm still doing the same work. It's just a different feeling. man. I don't know. I feel like I got the world behind me to help me do what I'm doing. And I think that's why they want the separation thing. That's why they want these categories. Because if we can get a person to be alone or feel alone, then that's when you got them. That's when you got them. That's when you can outcast them and they're weak. And now people, others don't want that light on them, the weak light. So you tend to let the light shine elsewhere. But one thing that's going on now with our generation, well, with the generations coming up and hopefully for your kids, to be the one to pick on people isn't the cool thing anymore. If you don't have a gay friend now, something's wrong with you. And back in the day, if you had a gay friend, they looked at you crazy. Yeah. So, you know, it's a different time now. And that's the great thing about what's going on now in the new generation is they want to drop these categories and these labels. They want to drop it so much that they want to drop the genders. I somewhat understand that because their whole thing is, and let's just quit pointing fingers and let's just love. Yeah. I agree to some point. The reason why I just can't go all the way into falling on is because we still have to have 
things created. But one thing I do love is the love that's been projected. And I just pray that if we can just keep this art going, if we just keep this art going, man, I really think that things have changed because it's hard to muffle the art. Well, art drives the culture. Bingo. And artists drive the culture. Uh, they set the tone. They drive certain messages. That old saying about does life imitate art or does art imitate life? Well, both. But the fact that artists set the tone and drive and so many of these politicians are reactive and they're self-interested and they only want to do what they need to do to keep their jobs and so on and so forth. They're not innovating. No. They're not leading. But artists do. Artists innovate. Artists lead. And so that's why, again, so much of what we're talking about is so important because that does fall on the artist a lot of times to speak truth to power, just to speak truth. Yeah, real, real major. I mean, and that's why for me, it's hard. I'm really into how many people are just, you don't even have to have the talent that a lot of artists have to project emotion. And the thing that I'm loving about this new technology of projection and stencils or just abstract, it's giving people the chance to just express themselves and be heard. And some people need this therapy. Yeah, man. Well, listen, I mean, Emerson years ago said, I think it was Emerson or Thoreau said, most people live lives of quiet desperation. That was what, 100 years ago, 80 years? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know when it was, you know? So, I mean, the point is, is that, yes, people do need to express themselves because I feel like on a certain level, we're all we're all hurting or we all have issues or we all feel alone or we're scared or we think we're alone or whatever it is. And the opportunity to be heard, as you've said, to express yourself, be heard, but also to commune and to have discourse. This is what's missing. I mean, shit, these fucking phones, man. They Phones have brought people close together, farther apart, and it, while they bring people farther apart, closer together. And, you know, I'm True. sorry, anything that's going to be a wedge in my community and in, in my neighborhood is a problem. And these fucking phones are a wedge. Yeah. But what would you do without it, though? I think right. so, well, I'm not... <laughs> That's it. That's what you I'm know? saying. I mean, we love them. But I mean, you know, the thing about the thing about it, though, of course, is, you know, those of us of a certain age, right? Like we remember the way it used to be. And so I feel like we have a balance in a way. I mean, we still struggle. I mean, I'm still on this thing too fucking much, but at least I know the way it was and the way it should be. And so I think we can strike a balance a little bit better. But these kids that were, you know, and are born digital and they're raised, yeah, they you know, on these fucking... Life. Yeah, it's too much. You know, everything in moderation, including moderation, but it's too much. Very I true. mean, anything, I'm sorry, but anything that mitigates or dilutes my humanity or humanity is a problem. If technology enhanced and enriched humanity and made us better humans, great. I'm all for that technology. But any well, technology no. that makes human beings redundant or atomizes our humanity, that's a problem. Well, that's the thing, Scott. Is that we monetize what we're supposed to do. Right. We come from a time where that's not all we had. So it doesn't eat our time up like that. And we utilize it like how we're on this now. Yeah. You know, right. we that's utilize right. it for what it's for. Like my Instagram, I sell my work. Yeah. You know, right. my Instagram was my web page for years. My Facebook, I don't really work my Facebook. My Facebook is just there for family to notice me and to see me. Right. Right. But my social media is strictly for business. Right. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. And one thing, my, you know, my lady always says it, and you're always in that. But one thing she does know, she's like, of course. I mean, that's how you make your money. And so people say, internet's bad. The web is this. The web. It's like money. It's like guns. Yeah, they are. Unless you know the proper way to use them. That's right. I mean, anything could be healthy or unhealthy. And knowing how to use those things, and it's so important. I mean, education is so important around these things and discipline. And I mean, it, it, again, it gets back to kind of like, it takes a village, you know, you can't, you can't defund education and, and wonder why the kids are fucked up. Why we're having problems. Yeah. Exactly. You know what I mean? Fucking you pull a string, you know, the sweater falls apart, all this shit, it works together. It's supposed to anyway. So there's a lot of people out there, you know, they've heard you talk about life on Skid Row and where you come from and stuff. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that they wonder what it's like out there on the streets. Maybe they want to help, but maybe they're scared. You know, they don't know what to do. What do people need to know about homelessness? What do people need to know about life on the streets? And how can people really help? I think one major way that people could help is for us to decriminalize it, stop making it shameful, because no one chooses it. No one chooses to be on the street. No one chooses to be outcast. 
I think one major way that people can help it is to first off decriminalize it and to stop making it shameful. If we would start calling people our neighbors instead of homeless, our neighbors on the street, you know, because everyone's our neighbor. God said, love thy neighbor, or the book says, love thy neighbor. So, I mean, the whole thing is you don't want to make a person feel bad for the positioning. And that's like always seeing someone say, hey, that, that fat kid over there. Who wants that greeting? Hey, you know, Johnny, the fat kid. And Johnny might love being fat, love eating cake and all that. But he didn't ask you to call him fat. So I think if we could find a different way of, of addressing the condition, it is a problem. But it's a problem that most people can't handle and they can't change it themselves. So it's a condition, like a mental health condition. You can't change it like that. So I think if we as individuals and as human beings, first off, to start considering these people as your neighbors, as your neighbor. Wouldn't you help your neighbor if your neighbor is in need? Or wouldn't you check on your neighbor if your neighbor is in need? The difference is this person just does not have walls. And since they don't have walls, that means they're on their front porch. So why not speak? Or why not greet? Or make sure that you acknowledge them? If we can just acknowledge that the people on the street are our neighbors, I think that would be a great start for um, people to drop whatever stigmas they have or whatever fears they have. Because a lot of times we love our neighbor. We're excited in our new neighborhood to meet our neighbors. If we can just start seeing people as our neighbors, then the energy will be given to you for you to pass everything else that you're looking at and just love the person that you're talking to. That would be a great start. I mean, that alone would just help clear some air. And then another thing, take time to start reading about harm reduction because we're decriminalizing those that are mentally ill and that are medicating to run from their problems. So if you can read up on harm reduction, you'll start to see why people get involved into drugs or get into harm reduction. It might key you in to seeing some of the symptoms that drive people into that mental state that sooner or later causes homelessness. So those are just two things. Those are two things that, that are simple. Those are two just small, simple things because, you know, bringing to lunch and all that, that helps and coming down to skid rolls, God loves you a lot. It always helps. But to get some understanding, I think, if you call someone your neighbor, that now allows you to want to project a certain kind of love. I love what you're saying, and it's so powerful. And only somebody who knows the deal could speak to this so eloquently and so thoughtfully and powerfully. Because basically what you've talked about was shifting your perception, your perception yeah. of yeah, what it perception. is. If we could just change how we've been taught. Yeah. Because it hasn't worked so far, right? right. I mean, it hasn't worked so far. What everything that's been done hasn't really worked. Again, you know, we all are on our journeys and what have you. I mean, for me, myself and I, anytime I, I see my neighbor and I think about their situation, I realize that there by the grace of God go I. I mean, it could be anybody, you know, and I mean, part of what I think the biggest mistake that people make is they think it, that it can't happen to them. This is like COVID. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It'll hit anybody. Yeah, exactly. I feel like we're so arrogant sometimes to think, oh, it can't be me. It won't be me. Bullshit. Nobody gives a shit about you. Shit can happen to anybody. Again, you know, we all have our experiences. I mean, one of the things that opened my eyes, I mean, I was in college years ago. I was living in Chicago and I was walking home from class one night down Michigan Avenue. It was a late class. So I don't know. It was like nine or 10 o'clock at night or whatever. And this homeless dude walks up to me and asked me if I have a smoke. I said, well, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I got a joint. Yeah, Because I happen to have a joint on me. One of my favorite things to do was to always smoke a joint as I walked home. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it, yeah. it was just beautiful, right? It was, I was done with yeah. school. It's a beautiful city. Like, I'll just smoke a J on the way home, whatever. And so John was his name. I'll never forget him. And John and I sat on the steps of the Museum of the Art Institute there on Michigan Avenue. And we smoked this joint. And we talked. I'm curious mind. You know, I said, why are you here? What happened? What's going on? And he just told me his story. And it was just a story that could have been any of us. He was married with a family. He had a job. He lost his job. The stress on the marriage was too much. The wife left him because she couldn't handle it. And next thing he know, she was gone. He didn't have a paycheck. He got evicted. She took the kids. And he's, yeah. done, and he's homeless. Just like that. Yeah. Mentally struck. Whole life that he traumatized, gone. right? Traumatized. Yeah. Just, I call it being sucker punched by the universe. Man, I got one. And not to cut you off, man. Yeah, I yeah no, go I for it. Yeah. He used to come buy drugs for me. He spent like 20 bucks every hour at the most. So wow. over a hundred bucks a day. And one day I asked him when he came to buy his last 20, I said, hey man, how'd you, you make good money. You come spend over a hundred dollars a day. Like, 
what happened that you became homeless? And he was a doctor. Came home one day, got the news, his wife, kids, side swipe. He left the house, didn't want to go back. Never went back home, never did anything else because his life had changed that fast. On the street now, just smoking, smart doctor. But reason for living, doesn't see it anymore. Now, I don't know where this guy is now. This was years ago. But imagine that. Imagine coming home, thinking you're about to wait for your kids and your wife to come home. And you get the call that they're never coming back because they've been hit and swiped, car accident. And you couldn't bounce back. He couldn't bounce back. Now, I can't imagine that, man. Like, if I didn't have my kid right now, fuck this art. I'd probably be the biggest dope dealer downtown Skid Row ever. Because I already know that, I mean, look, they let these cops off again, man. These cops just got off again. Regardless of what I do, I'm in a world where I still haven't been written in the Constitution as not being cattle. Are they sitting here talking about Black Lives Matter and all this equality shit? Nobody's written the Constitution and rewritten that shit. Still written in the Constitution as property. Still got to vote for rights. My kids, the only reason that makes me say, I got to give better, I got to do better, I got to be here for them. But if I have kids, uh, I'd be saying, fuck the world, I'm going to get what I can get. Because that's what they do to, to society anyway. They get what they can get out of us. But I'm just glad I have my kid, man, because I don't think that way, like I said. Yeah, I mean, but listen, this culture, and man and I talk about this a lot, because Latino culture, Hispanic culture, Mexican culture specifically, they respect family. They yeah. respect their parents and their grandparents, you know, they look Whoa. after each other. But generally speaking, in America, getting older is not a virtue. It's about being young. It's about being rich. And this idea of looking after family and your children is secondary almost. You yeah. know, it's funny. I'll read um, the Wall Street Journal for business, obviously, but they always have like those obituaries and it's always some titan of industry or some rich CEO who's died. And they're writing about all their accomplishments. And I always think to myself, they're talking about how great this person was and all the shit they did. I always think to myself, I wonder what their kids think about them. Because <laughs> to me, that's the only legacy that fucking matters. And I'm willing to yeah. bet, because I know I know enough to know that you can't accomplish all that shit without sacrificing something. Without sacrificing you for you. You're right. And, You're and right. I'm going to guess. I, I <laughs> Right. I wonder that right now, man. Like, am I trying to do too much by saving the world or should I be trying to save my kids? Well, you're trying and to I do both, it, right? You're trying well, to do both. Is, yeah. I see is what I'm doing for the world is hopefully laying a red carpet for my kids. Yes. Yes. Well, you're setting hopefully an example. Doing, yeah. 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 Hopefully what I'm doing for society, they're gracious towards my kids for that. Like they haven't killed King's kids. One of the King's kids, they haven't had to march nothing. They haven't went to jail. Nobody's killed them. We don't even need them to say nothing. And they're still okay. I would hope that I could open some doors for my kids and make things happen just because people are like, man, your father was a good person. Here's an opportunity. What we end up doing, whether we realize it or not, it seems to me, is demonstrating our values. And our kids, we transfer our values to our kids. We show at least our kids like what we find to be important, what our values are. And that's it. That's all there is. And you might think that you're transferring certain values, but your actions are different than the kids pick up on that. You know, so yeah. you're demonstrating a certain set of values to your kids and your actions match your values. So that's integrity, right? Yeah. I just told my son that there's some things that I want him to have more. He has confidence. I need him to have that confidence out of this world. Confidence I need him to have, but I need him to have more integrity. And I asked him, do you know what integrity meant? And he said, no. And I said, that's doing the right things when no one's watching. That's what I need you to get better at is your integrity. And I need you to be a leader. You need to learn how to lead. And that's why I told him, you already got the courage thing down, but if you can get your integrity up, and if you can learn to be a leader, yeah, you'll be all right. So that's what I'm focusing on right now with my son, man, because integrity is a big thing. Are you doing the right thing when no one's looking? And that is the best way to describe it, because that's what it is. That sense of honor to yourself and to the world. Well, yeah, I mean, because we have purpose, man. And one thing that I've been following on and I've been really holding on to a lot is it's always better to have purpose than a career or a job, because you'll be considered more valuable if you're in your purpose. Huge point you're making right now. Huge point. What's your purpose? What is your purpose? And that's the thing, man. Like, I don't think a lot of people realize that purpose. We get so sidetracked with these labels that we quit being a human being. Even though these trees have labels, like, like I always look at the trees, Scott. We're here in California. These trees, they're domestic, right? 
Well, except the palm tree, <laughs> which is, I mean, but yeah. yes, yes. I mean, if you're talking about indigenous. Well, hold on. I don't think any of them actually, because all this is desert, right? Yeah. Southern California, definitely desert. It's yeah. all desert. So all yeah. these trees are basically brown here. Yeah, probably. Most, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If you're not a succulent, you're probably Yeah, right. Brown. That's right. <laughs> all right. Exactly. That's so right. We'll just run we'll yeah. just, we'll just, if you're not we'll a succulent, you fuck you. Get it. <laughs> yeah. If you're not a succulent, you're a brown here, right? So you're funny. Yeah. All right, so that means all these trees that are here now, they're not from this land, but they still stay in their purpose. Like the trees that come from the Midwest, when fall comes, they still change autumn colors. Yep. The weather's not even changing, but those trees still change the colors of autumn. They still shed. They blossom again. So regardless of where they're placed, they know their purpose. And I don't think us as humans, even though wherever we're placed, we, we tend to lose our purpose. We want to be the star. We want to be the square. And when you're a circle, you're supposed to be a circle. You can't be something else. And that's the problem we're having as human beings. We don't know purpose. We get placed in situations that we don't know our purpose. You know, I love this metaphor of the tree. I'm going to, because as I'm thinking about it, what's dawning on me too is that the purpose of the tree, right? At the end of the day, it creates oxygen, right? Keep going. Right. What else does it do? So without what else? trees, we don't have oxygen. So what else does it do, Scott? So the tree. What is the purpose of the tree? The tree ultimately is is meant to feed us, to keep us alive, to keep us healthy, because it creates oxygen as well as maybe food or shelter for the animals and what have you. And therefore, as people, as human beings, our purpose must also be to feed others and create a hospitable planet for all. And do like the trees, right? And That's do right. just like the trees. You're That's supposed right. to take your foundation. Yeah. You're supposed to plow the land like their roots do, right? Their roots yeah. get into the ground. They yeah. break up everything so everything can grow yep. and migrate, right? And do all that. That's what we're supposed to do as humans. We're supposed to get out here. I'm supposed to plow this land. And I'm supposed to plow it so well that someone can come behind me and plant a seed and grow. Yep. I just think that if we would focus on purpose, it'd be all right. Yeah, man. I mean, we worship so many false idols. Yeah. There's so many reasons for this. It's an insidious thing. That's why I hope people that are listening to this conversation, they're inspired to, if they're not paying attention, to wake up to the influences all around trying to distract us from what we're supposed to be and our purpose, right? This year, one of my goals this year, it wasn't even that I'm not a New Year's resolutions kind of guy, but anytime. I have a birthday or anytime a new year turns around, I start thinking about, well, how do I want to grow this year? What do I want to learn? What do I want to do? And so yeah. this year I decided that I would finally embrace meditation. Okay. And, you know, I okay. flirted with meditation over the years, way back in high school, but at the end of the day, I just wasn't ready. It wasn't my thing, whatever. I knew it was cool and I knew it worked, but it just wasn't the right time for me. So anyway, this year, for all kinds of reasons, I realized it was time. It was time for me to embrace meditation. And, you know, and I'm a neophyte. I'm a newbie. I'm just, just learning. But I mean, every day for the last four months, I've been studying and reading and learning and practicing and what have you. And one of the things that comes out of this, at least for me, is this idea that my purpose, really all of our purposes, is to stay centered. Stay centered. Yeah. That's the work, you know, because. That's the work. That's, that's the work. That's the work to not allow someone to shift you. Right. And move you in these little categories. That's right. That's the key that you said. And people would normally say a religion or some of that or this or that makes you centered. But the key is to just stay centered. Just stay centered, man. And what's going on in the outside doesn't have anything to do with what's going on in the inside. At you all. control what's no. on the inside. You can't control, you control what's it. on the outside. It doesn't fucking matter. You control what's on the inside. Stay centered. Yeah. And I think that my little brother told me that one day and I started seeing things different and I started getting different results because I centered myself different to where what I'm seeing is totally different. So my path turned, surroundings changed. So it's about really being centered. I think that's the main focus on where it's at, staying centered. What allows me to stay centered is being free. The only time I'm ever free is when I'm painting. That's why I put the mask on because my whole thing is, my profile and my identity of who I really am is never free. Mm. Never free. A felon, they want to call him black, a bunch of other stipulations. But this yeah. mask and this art, it's no selling. And, and it leads me to still be free. Yes. Because you can't point at who this artist is. And, and it allows me also to be at an art show and be able to hear what people have to say about the free-spirited art with no comment coming back from me because it's not me. 
<laughs> right. So it always works, man. And that's what made me say, you know what? I'm going to always stay masked up because my thing was, I'm only free when I'm painting. That's the only time when I have no judgment on me. Mm. I'm not worried about what anyone thinks. Even when I enter art contest and things of that fashion, I'm not even in it to win. And if I don't win, it doesn't mean I lost because the whole thing is I'm just trying to have it seen. I just want to be seen. I just need someone to see it. So even if they're offering an award or some kind of anything afterwards, that doesn't move me. What moves me is the opportunity to show. Yeah. Yeah. Seizing opportunities. That's the other thing, too. I mean, how many people out there just let shit go by? They don't take action and accept responsibility, right, for their purpose right and for the situation and to try to they wait for the right opportunity they wait for this they wait for that it's amazing it's like you're starving but yet you're gonna be choosy man oh man shows art i tell you brother i appreciate you so much man i mean the fact that you and i were able to come together tonight and talk and just be together man i haven't i miss you man Hey, same here, man. And the great thing is, now with us checking in, I actually have an art studio. I actually have an art studio. I got a webpage now, too, man. Dot com. Tell us where we can find uh, you. That's my webpage. Or on IG, it's, yeah, S-H-O-W-Z. With a Z, by the way, people. A-R-T. Shows art. And then when it comes S-H-O-W-Z. to uh, underscore S-H-O-W-Z-A-R-T underscore. But yeah, you can go on the webpage, showsart.com, and I have prints up of what you see behind me and a couple other gifts that I think people will really be intrigued on. And then I think it would really be nice for people to know that whatever proceeds and, I mean, whatever you guys purchase, whenever anyone goes to my site, I take a portion of the proceeds and it goes back to the streets because my thing is, how can I help create jobs with this artwork? So when I'm getting murals, I'm hiring people from the streets to help me with the murals. When it comes to you buying my art pieces, a lot of times it gives me money and funds to help those on the street because we're not getting as much funds now with COVID going on. So a lot of times people are needing extra funds. And I think that's how, well, I'm pretty sure that's how we're all being successful. We're all looking out for each other in our community. So uh, I just appreciate the opportunity, Scott. Not Real Art has always had my back since we've been on the deuce. I remember you guys giving me an opportunity to come to many of your events and being able to network with great people to help expand my network. I appreciate the opportunity, brother, so much. And we appreciate you, and it's your gift to us as much, if not more, than we might be to you. And boy, we look forward to going back and doing those events again, don't we? Yeah, man. Yes. You know, it's about time to come straight out of quarantine, man. We got to come out hard. We thought we were throwing some good parties before. Just wait till the next one. (laughs) Man, man, that's one thing, man. Not real art has some of the best parties, man. That's one thing I can't wait to get back to those, man. Because it's about the people, right? And we got some good people coming to our events, right? You know what, man? That's an understatement. You got great people that come to your functions, man. Great people. So, yeah, let's make that statement a great one instead of good people, man. And I really appreciate it, man. Looking forward to it again, man. This is going to be a real great year. Uh, Mad Dog 2020 was a, it was a good year for me. A lot of people said 2020 was a bad year, but it was a great year for me, man. I, like I said, me coming from Skid Row, I'm constantly in a pandemic. Yeah. It's, it's a constant pandemic. I'm not sure how many hepatitis C we've been through, bed bugs. It's just been so many different things when you come from that area that it's just... Just another one put on the list when they brought COVID. But to see the growth of how we're coming out of this and to understand that whoever has survived this, you're a winner. And shit, we've come out of this. So we can take it all, man. So it's going to be good to see how we're coming out. And I'm excited. Me too, brother. Me too. Love to you. Love to the family. Love to your son. All the time, man. Hey, I'm saluting out, Scott. I appreciate the opportunity, champ. Thank you so much. You're going to come back and solve the world's problems with us again later on? Man, I'm looking forward to it, man. Looking forward to it. Let me know when we can do this again. All right. And this time, now I kind of have to figure it out. I have to champ, make sure we get on and we won't have those problems. Well, I'll tell you what, I appreciate you uh, working with me tonight to get on this platform. I mean, this high-tech stuff sometimes is a, <laughs> it's a real pain. And this new platform we're testing out, which actually, you know, now that we're using it and we're in it, it's pretty cool. It's pretty groovy. I'm liking what I'm seeing, but it was a bit painful tonight for us to try to get going. But I appreciate you hanging in there with me, brother. Well, no, man, I really appreciate the opportunity, man. This Not Real Art is going to be one of the biggest platforms 
in the world, man. So uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it while, while we're talking. Oh, man, from your mouth to God's ears, brother. I appreciate it. I mean, we're here to help artists tell their stories and promote their work. Artists have enough critics. They need more cheerleaders. We're cheerleaders. We're not critics. That's what we're about. But uh, you have a beautiful night, my friend, and can't wait to see you soon. Hey, sign off, man. Hey, not real art. You guys tune in. Show's art. Peace. Peace. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at NotRealArtWorld.